Um, step aside here. Uh, my name is Marty Shingler. I'm a faculty member here in the Engineering uh, Technologies Division. I'm also in charge of the Siemens Distinguished Lecture Series. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Kip Marlowe, president of the Raymond C. Uh, Kralovic Center for Entrepreneurship. Kip's a serial entrepreneur, as he likes to call himself. And he'll talk about some of his uh, adventures and talk about the center. I'd also like to have a few acknowledgments. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague Gretchen Scope DeSano for putting on um, Entrepreneurship Week and inviting, <laughs> inviting us to be part of it. I'd also like to acknowledge the Siemens Building, um, Building Products Division for uh, sponsoring the Siemens Lecture Series and sponsoring this event. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Kip. Thank you, Marty. I appreciate that very much. Today we're just going to talk about entrepreneurship, obviously. I'm going to tell some stories about entrepreneurship. I'm going to ask you some questions, so be ready, because I want to get some feedback from, from you guys and girls in the audience here. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing I want to ask is, what's an entrepreneur? Who's got an idea? What's an entrepreneur? Come on, let's go. Yes, ma'am. Someone who creates a product or service and puts it out to people. Exactly. Anybody else have a definition of an entrepreneur? Yes, sir. Someone who likes to do business and make business. I like that. Dude, you got it. That's the second one. Anybody else have anything? Yes, sir. Somebody who is willing what it takes to be successful. Bingo. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, anybody here own a business? Do you? You do? Anybody else up there? Good. So we're going to talk about being in business, and we're going to talk about entrepreneurship. I'm going to ask the next question is, do you have to be a Harvard MBA to be an entrepreneur? Can anybody be an entrepreneur? Yes. yes. Almost. Almost anybody. Absolutely. I want to tell you a story about a fellow that went to this school. His name is Keith Kokel. Now, I'm not knocking education, Dr. Shingler. Don't, don't, you know, I'm not doing this. I'm just saying that you've got a crazy um, bunch of entrepreneurs out there with all kinds of education. But his name is Keith Kokel, and he started a company called Micro Labs. But I always look at the stories behind the person. Why did he start it? Well, first of all, he grew up in the west side of Cleveland. It, actually, it was in... Um, Oh my goodness, just, just near west. What's that? Tremont. He grew up in Tremont when uh, Tremont wasn't so good. And at the age of 10 years old, his parents were broke. He had no money, so he tried to do things like shine shoes at local bars to make money for food. That was Keith. Several times he'd have a good load of, uh, of, um, of uh, change in his pocket, and he would get, walk home and he'd get robbed. That's Keith. Before he, he got to the 10th grade, Keith was shot twice and stabbed once. But that didn't stop him. And he, he went to school here. I don't know if he graduated. I, took, I know he took a lot of courses here. And he learned business. And he started his own company called Micro Laboratories and, uh, in Mentor, just off of Tyler, if I remember correctly. And that's, that's, a, that's so not. A, not typical, but almost typical of people who start companies. Anybody know the name Sergey Brin? Who's Sergey Brin? Um, you asked me too fast. <laughs> hey, Tyler, Google. Google. He co-founded Google with Larry Page. Do you know what his background is? His parents and he lived in Moscow. Jewish family. They were terribly discriminated against because they were Jewish. So his father wanted to get out and go to, the, go to America, where everybody was pretty free. And so he applied for a visa or whatever you apply for to get out of the, get out of the country. And he, was, uh, he had to take menial jobs. He had his PhD, by the way. He had to take menial jobs to get going and, get, and, and just wait for the approval, which took one year, to leave the country. 
and they had to take care of Sergey. Well, Sergey came over, got pretty well educated, and started Google. Not a bad story. Did he have a Harvard MBA? Nah. He did end up going to Stanford, but he didn't have any college when he started Google. And that's not too shabby. I went to Bowling Green State University. And you know why I started my company? Actually, years ago, I started Marlowe Surgical Technologies in 1975, and I sold it in 1997. Um, the way I started it is because I got fired. I got fired from my job as a corporate guy. And I hated corporate work. So what can you do? I didn't, like to go, I didn't want to go back to, to corporate work, so I decided I'm going to start my own business. So I got into the surgical instrument business. And the reason I, the way I got into it was I just befriended some doctors. And the doctors and I decided to invent products together. And we had them made. They were manufactured mostly in Lake County. I'm, I'm happy to say. We had them made. Uh, we ended up with eight patents, eight patents on products. And I have to tell you this story. Some of you may have heard it. I know Gretchen's heard it like 100 times, but I have to tell you this story. We had a patent on a surgical scissor with a long handle and a disposable scissor. In surgery, the sharper the better. So you, it's really not good to use, re, use scissors that have already been used. So we had this patent, and we were selling the heck out of it. Come on in. Come on down. And we were selling the heck out of it. And um, one of my salesmen at a conference, you know, where you have stands and booths and all that kind of stuff, and you show your wares. And, uh, one of my salesmen called me from the conference and he said, are we selling this product to Decnatel? I'm going to name names here. And I said, no. He said, well, then they've just copied our product. Now, at the time, I was like a $5 million a year business. Decnatel was a $2 billion a year business. Um, the chances of me winning any lawsuit were rather slim. But I did call the president of Decnatel. And, I, and his name was Bill Dow, a really nice guy. And I called him, I said, Mr. Dow, you know, you copied our product, we have a patent on that. And he said, basically, I don't care, kid, sue me. <laughs> that was fun, that was a good day. Everything was going well until that call. So um, I went to my finance department, which was one person. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we've got to sue these people. The patents aren't any good if you don't want to protect them. And he said, well, find out where, you know, find out how much it's going to cost. So I talked to the attorney, and he said, about 100000 over a period of probably a couple of years. Well, I didn't have 100000 I didn't even have 1000 um, So I went to the attorney, and I said, and I got entrepreneurial here. And I said, if I paid you a couple thousand a month, would you take this case? And then you can, after I'm gone, you can collect it from my children and my wife and you know, all that kind of stuff. Would you take this case? And I couldn't believe what he said. He said, sure. So we sued him in federal court in Cleveland, Ohio. And we sat there, me and my attorney, waiting for the first hearing. I think they call it depositions, you know, where you take depositions. So me and my attorney, who's a great guy, his name is Ted Lenish. I don't know if he's still around. He's probably retired, which is what I should be, but I'm not. Um, so Ted, it was Ted and I, and we were waiting for these, the other attorneys to come in, and in walks five attorneys, all wearing black suits, red ties, all with Yale University horn rim glasses, all with Yale haircuts. Anybody here going to end up at Yale? I hope not. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Gretchen. <laughs> um, 
And they walked in and I was, I was just flabbergasted because they, that, the, it, they came from the most intellectual, intellectual property, the most influential intellectual property firm on the East Coast. They flew in from Boston. So I turned to Ted, my attorney, and I said, hmm, I think we're toast, Ted. Why don't we just drop this thing? I, we're, there's no way we're going to win this. I love it when he does that. Yeah. So I'm telling this story because I didn't give up. <laughs> um, so Ted turned to me after I said that. I said, we're toast, Ted. And he said, don't, you know, just they're only trying to intimidate you. And I said, well, they're doing a hell of a good job at it. I'll tell you that. I'm scared to death. So that deposition was over. Six weeks later, I get a call from Mr. Bill Dow, the president of Decnatel. And he calls me and he says, hey, Kip, how you doing? When he said Kip, I knew I had him. Because he always cost me, called me Mr. Marlowe before. He said, you know, this is so typical. He says, you know, neither one of us should be spending a lot of money on this lawsuit. Can we settle this thing? It's just kind of getting in the way. And I said, sure. And I gave him my terms. And he accepted them. And I should have given him higher terms. But I probably would have been better, but I, I didn't. I wasn't a great negotiator. So anyway, uh, we, we ended up, like 60 days later, getting a check for $257,000 and an 8% royalty on every little scissor they sold for the life of the patent. They still could, they still could sell it, but I didn't have to work for that 8% because they're the ones that had to work for it. That was a major victory. Yes. I, because if I hadn't have tried to defend that patent, my company would have been gone. You can't go up against a $2 billion company and survive. It's just not, not in the medical device field. That is one lesson I learned. However, the biggest lesson I learned was this. Anybody have any friends here? Anybody have any friends that they talk to? Huh? We all do. Uh, they all, do they all support you? If they don't support you, get rid of them, okay? I had a little advisory board that I called my kitchen cabinet. And it was several local entrepreneurs who were very, very um, experienced at business. <clears throat> And one of them was a doctor at Hillcrest Hospital, right down the road here. His name is Stanley Pollock. I just saw him two weeks ago. Great guy, retired, playing golf every day in Florida. He was the head of the OBGYN department at Hillcrest. He delivered my kid. Oh, geez, okay, all right. 42 years ago. Okay, 42. You're not that old, are you? <laughs> um, uh, and Stanley was a great guy, and he knew me well, and every couple of weeks we'd have lunch, uh, talk about new products, ideas, and all that kind of stuff. And one day he came into the office and he said, you don't look so good. And I said, well, I don't feel so good. I got myself into a jam. I owed creditors, rent, payroll to the tune of $100,000 that I had to pay within a week and a half. And I didn't have it. <coughs> so Stanley says, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I've got to figure it out. I've got a week and a half to figure it out. So he pulled out his checkbook and he wrote me a check for $100,000. And he handed it to me and he said, pay me back when you can. And it was made out to me, so I was ready to take off for Disney World or something, you know. <laughs> but that's what networking is for. Oh, by the way, the second thing he said was, don't cash that check till tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> he had to switch some money. Um, there's a lot of things that I learned, but I want to keep going with some stories, if I may. Um, Anybody know the name Willis Carrier? Willis Carrier. 
first part of the last century, the early 1900s, Willis Carrier was poor, but he had a hardware store. And next to the hardware store was this book binding company. Now, many of you here don't know what book binding is because now it's all digital and it's totally different. But you bound books. And the book binding company went to Mr. Carrier and said, my books, when there's high humidity, tend to kind of turn. They, 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 they deform a little bit. Is there anything we can do about that? So Mr. Carrier just said, oh, well, let me work on that. And he built this little device, gave it to the bookbinder. The guy turned it on, and it worked. It took the humidity out of the air, it, and it did one more thing that they didn't anticipate. It cooled off the bookbinding company. Think about that. Think about that. You talk about an entrepreneur who changed the world. He invented air conditioning. What would it be like in Florida in August without air conditioning? Or South Carolina? Or Africa? Or wherever? He, and he didn't even try to invent it for that purpose. He just wanted to help his friend that owned the bookkeep, book binding company. So when you go along and you see somebody that's famous, just for the heck of it, look up their backgrounds. Very few are wealthy. Very few um, had their Harvard MBAs. They just found something to invent. And they did it. And that's what an entrepreneur does. I, along with the doctors, invented quite a few surgical instruments. And they were mainly for small incision surgery of the abdominal cavity, mostly gynecology. We treated endometriosis and we treated all kinds of things. We ended up having products that would uh, do hysterectomies through small incisions. It really kind of changed the world of, of gynecology. And I didn't change it. A bunch of us did. Other companies did the same thing. But it changed the world of surgery where Somebody used to go in for surgery one day, they'd have to be there for 10 days. Now you go into surgery and you have minimally invasive surgery and you go home the same day. I'll tell you this, I had heart surgery about two years ago. It was a six hour procedure. It was minimally invasive. I went in at six o'clock in the evening and came out at midnight. And the doctor had already done two of those, and I said, doctor, when you, are you sure you want to do it on me? I mean, you got two done already. Why don't you take a break? I'll stay overnight, you know? But it worked out, and I was home the next day. I felt fantastic. That's what can be done in surgical instruments. That's what being, is being done around the country. You know, Facebook, how, how has that changed the world? LinkedIn, how has that changed the world? And I do want to tell you about, and I'll have a lot of other things to say. I do want to tell you about Dr. Raymond C. Kralovic, the Center for Entrepreneurship. First of all, has anybody heard of Ray? Anybody heard of him? Ray was a friend of mine. He passed away two and a half years ago. Um, he grew up in West Virginia, so one leg is shorter than the other, you know, because he's always on, never mind. Uh, <laughs> He, is, uh, uh, he, was a, he was a great guy, and he went to West Virginia University to get his uh, doctorate degree in microbiology. And he went to work for a company in um, Erie, Pennsylvania called AMSCO, American Sterilizer. They sterilized surgical instruments. But they couldn't sterilize flexible endoscopies like colonoscopes, like it's the scopes that go down, you know, the flexible scopes that go down your throat, stuff like that. They couldn't sterilize that. Believe it or not, until Ray came along, those were just cleaned and di disinfected. They weren't sterilized. So Ray said, I've got a way to do this. He went to his vice president of something, said, I can do this. Give me $100,000 and a desk and a lab, and I'll come up with a, I'll come up with a magic potion 
that we can sterilize flexible instruments? And they said, no. So he did it again, and they said, he, he, he went to them again, said, just give me $100,000 and a desk and a little lab. And they said, no, we're doing just fine. And then Ray made his big mistake. He went to the company picnic, and he went to the same vice president and said, please, can we talk? Just give me that $100,000 and da, 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 da. And they fired him. Have you ever been fired? I have been, but never at the company picnic. Never. Never. So Ray decided that he was going to pursue his project, and he found some money. He had three kids. He drove them from Erie, Pennsylvania to Mentor on Tyler Boulevard with a partner, and he came up with this formula. <laughs> Anybody heard of the company called Steris? $3 billion later in revenues, 5,000 employees worldwide. That's what Ray created. <clears throat> now, he was smart enough to know that as a, as a, biolo or as a microbiologist that he, um, you know, he couldn't run the company. As it started to grow, he couldn't run it. So he brought in some real heavy hitters to be able to run. They raised a lot of money. They raised millions of dollars. And a fellow named Bill Sanford came in, which, who did a wonderful job as CEO, and took them to the next level. But Ray all started this because he got fired. Now, he did have his doctorate degree. Didn't have an MBA from Harvard. But he did have his doctorate degree. But the impetus for him to do this was getting fired. My company ended up to be about an $8 million a year company. Not a big deal compared to Steris. Um, but I got fired. And so many people out there that are laid off, I see it at the Entrepreneurship Center, so many people that have been laid off or retired early are coming to us with product ideas. And here's what the center does. We are a nonprofit. And I have cards here if anybody has any ideas for products. And we're free. We're all volunteers. We're crazy, uh, recovering entrepreneurs who, who just want to help. Because it's, uh, it's part of our mantra to give back as much as we can. So I'm the president of it. We have 10 mentors. We have 63 uh, people who've signed up for the program. Uh, 45 or so are intimately involved with being, uh, with being counseled and mentored. And we're to the point where we've brought in people who can talk about intellectual property. Can my product be patented? We got somebody to bring in. Where do I go? If it can be patented, where do I go? We've got the people to go to. Um, if you want to design your product, whether you can patent it or not, we've got a design firm called Balance in Cleveland. They charge. Uh, but it's a great firm. And it really is something you should look at if you have a good product or a good product idea. Please look at Balance because they have made, they have designed products for so many companies from Hoover uh, to Moen to, uh, uh, they're doing projects for Steris right now. You know, you got 5,000 employees at Steris and they can't even design their own products. <laughs> so, so they go to Balance. And they pay, a, they pay a lot of money since they're a big company. <clears throat> so that's the story of Ray. How oh, my time? Wow. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, anybody hear of Kevin Plank? You've heard of Kevin Plank, haven't you? I'm not going to call on you just yet. <laughs> Kevin Plank was a walk-on football player at the University of Maryland. Anybody here play football in school, high school? Do you remember those two-a-day workouts? in the summer in August that we all hated. Remember that? Yeah. And it was just, oh, and your, the, your undershirt, you went in the locker after the first practice and your undershirt was just filthy and you had to put it back on later because you weren't smart enough to go to mom and you know, get a second undershirt, you know, stuff like that. Um, and it clung to you. 
Well, Kevin noticed that when he was a walk-on on the football team. He was a terrible football player, by the way. Uh, he noticed that. So I love these backgrounds. So he decided, you know, there's a problem. And by the way, entrepreneurs do three things. They find a problem, they solve the problem, and then they tell the world about it. Three things, it's easy. But what Kevin did was he went to, went to the garment district in New York City from Baltimore. Um, he found some, some uh, material, bought a bunch of it, took it back to his, his grandmother's basement, and sewed it all himself, put it in the back of his car, in the trunk of his car, and he went from school to school to school selling these products. And he did pretty well at it. That's the way he started. What's the name of the company now? Under Armour. Three billion dollars a year, 5,000 employees. Kevin Plank is worth one billion dollars. Started with nothing. Started in his grandmother's basement. Now, by golly, if I can be relatively successful, and Kevin Plank can be wildly successful, and Ray Krolovic can be wildly successful, everybody in this room could be successful. You're not, we're not any smarter than you are. We just found a problem, solved the problem, and told the world. Understand? Get the point? I don't care whether you graduate from high school. I wrote a book called The Entrepreneur, Success, and Sacrifice. Some of the people in the book had no high school. None, very successful. There's a fellow down the street here, Roger Sustar, did graduate from high school. Roger is on the board now of Lakeland. Isn't he on the board, Gretchen? Yeah, he's on the board of Lakeland. He did graduate from high school, no college, and just self-taught. And one of the things that I've learned in life as an entrepreneur is this what you learn after you know it all that counts. <laughs> so believe me, get good grades here, do well here, study hard here, learn a lot here, but keep learning. Keep learning. There's some great business books out there. Uh, you've got good to great. You've got so many good business books out there, and some of them are, are, have been on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list for years. They're so popular, and they're, so, they're not dated in any way. The same fundamentals apply today as 10 years ago. Does that make sense? You guys agree with that? I got another person here that's one of my favorite people. I used to have a radio show. And I interviewed entrepreneurs locally and throughout the country. And I interviewed a lady by the name of Judy Shepard Missett. Does that name sound familiar to any of the ladies here? You're, you're going like this, aren't you? She grew up on a farm in Minnesota, had no money started a little uh, gym for, for ladies in somewhere in a suburb of, of Minnesota, realized that the ladies don't want to do push-ups and sit-ups and you know, stretching exercises all day, so she added music to it, added pizzazz to it. And then she decided that's the way it's going to be, and I'm going to franchise these all over the world. Well, Judy Shepard Missit has franchised now 7,000 franchises all over the world called Jazzercise. Very successful. Has 300 employees in Southern California. Very successful. Started on a farm. Started with a little, with no money and a little storefront and figured it out. It works that way. And by the way, getting back, I'm going back and forth a little bit too much I suppose, but. Getting back to the Raymond C. Krolovic Center for Entrepreneurship, I've got cards up here, but if you can remember this, the domain name is lakestart.org. Go to it and take a look at it. If you have a product idea, just submit an application. We'll get it that day, and we'll give you a call, and we'll meet. And we have an office in Willoughby, at the Willoughby City Hall. 
um, believe it or not. We have no money. We, we, we raised about $12,000, and you got to pay insurance and, and all that kind of stuff, a website, things like that. Uh, and I didn't have a place to be. I didn't have an, an office. I said, geez, you know, dumb. I got to have a place to go. They're not going to come to my family room, you know, and be counseled. So I called Dave Anderson, the mayor of Willoughby, and I said, Dave, he, we've known each other for quite some time. And Dave, and I said, Dave, I need an office. And he says, you got to be crazy. I said, no, I really need an office. Do you have one available? And he said, well, let me call you back. And I said, oh, Dave, hang on a minute. It's got to be free. He says, he says, it's not going to be free. <laughs> so Dave, the secret to Dave's success is he calls you back right away. Ha hour later, he calls me back. He says, I got an office for you. Come on down. We got it. Um, I signed the lease that day, uh, but it was costly. It was $1 per year. And, and I had a hard time writing that check. It was the smallest check <laughs> I've ever wrote in my life. I wish I had a lot of those $1 checks, but that was the smallest one I've ever wrote, written. Um, but there's a, also a story behind that office. The office is right next to Dave Anderson's, the mayor's. And it once belonged to a lady who was murdered in Concord. It was his administrative assistant. Um, Peggy Kostelnik, um, and she was murdered. They kept, they loved her so much, they kept her office dark and empty for eight months. And when I found that out, I said, you gotta be kidding me. I can't take this office. Everybody in City Hall will hate me. And they said, no, everybody wants to move on from it. So I got the office, it's on the second floor. If you ever wanna visit me, that's where I usually am, okay? We're a mentoring and advising organization. Think intellectual property, think raising money, because we do, we can get you to people who could raise money to start a company. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Think about product design, think of, there's so many things to think about, but we have the availability of getting you to the right people. We've got a good resource list. The people want to work with us. <clears throat> I have one more person I want to talk about. I'm okay time-wise, Marty. Am I right? One more? Is that right? Anybody want to hear a Cleveland entrepreneur named Francis Drury? Nobody knows him? Francis Drury had a hardware store, just, just like the other guy. And um, he decided he was going to make a kerosene, and this is at the first, you know, early 1900s again, he was going to make a kerosene heater. Instead of bringing the wood in from outside and cutting it and chopping it, he's going to have a kerosene heater. So he made the kerosene heater. And uh, who at the time do you think sold a lot of kerosene? Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Rockefeller found out about this thing. He says, the greatest thing in the world. I'll help you sell them. And the more you sell, the more kerosene I'm going to sell. And not only did Rockefeller say that, he did it, and he even gave um, Mr. Drury um, the names of all his contacts. So Mr. Drury just write saying, say, hey, you know, we've got this thing. It's cost $3, and um, you don't have to bring your wood in anymore. You know, you use this to heat your house. And it worked. He didn't know it, but he changed the world. Now, it's a pretty standard thing. Now, we, we don't use kerosene, but you use gas or electricity for your furnace. They changed the world. Didn't have any money, had no education, ended up partnering from, with John D. Rockefeller. Can you believe that? I would have loved to partner with John D. Rockefeller. That would have been pretty cool. But he did that. So I got to wrap it up because uh, Dr. Shingler is giving me the high sign over here. Uh, well, I think what we're going to want to do is if there's any questions, let's, we can do a roundtable discussion. We can do whatever you want to do. It's up to the class and Dr. Shingler. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Appreciate it.
Well, we don't, you can't patent the name of the company, but you can trademark it. And then you trademark it through the state of Ohio or go right down the hallway here to the Small Business Development Center and they'll help you do it free. You can go to an attorney, but it costs you. Um, you, you know, you, so what you do is you just trademark it. You have to send the federal government some money. It's like 150 bucks. But I'd highly recommend you register uh, the name of your company. It's a really good idea. And regarding patents, um, you know, if you've got an idea and you think it's, and you think it's patentable, uh, give us a call, because we have Dr. Nyan Shaw. Dr. Shaw is um, uh, MD, PhD, MBA, something else. He's got all kinds of letters behind his name. And, uh, and Nyan is a great guy, and he'll be able to tell almost immediately whether it's a patentable type product. Uh, for example, we had a person come in to Lake Start. I counseled him. He had a great idea for a product, and I can tell you the product now because it's out on the market, and it wasn't his. It was a product, he was, he was, um, he was watching his kids play soccer, watching his kids go back, and he was using his iPhone to video it, and he said, boy, it would be nice if I just had a camera in my glasses, where I can just do this, and for 15 seconds, I could do this, and I would take a video. With your neck, it's a fulcrum. You know, when you have, got, when you have your iPhone, it kind of bounces around. Well, he came to us and he wanted to patent it, and we thought it would be a good idea until we really looked into it. And there were a ton of patents around that product. And they were all Silicon Valley patents. So we decided to say, uh, you know, Jason, do what you want to do, but we would highly re recommend you be careful because these people do not take prisoners. If they come after you, they're gonna come after big and you're gonna lose your house and your wife and your car and your kids, your driveway and your, probably your sewer system. So, you know, so be careful. And he decided against it. He decided not to do it. So you gotta be very careful. If it's a high tech product, you gotta do a lot of research. But if it's a product like my scissor uh, that was patented, um, uh, you can work around other patents. And having a patent will last you 19 years. And that is from the time that you apply for the patent with the federal government until the end of the patent. So if it takes two years to get the patent, you only have 17 years left. But that really gives you a monopoly on that product for 17 years. So it's very important. If you have a patentable product, go after it. Just go after it. Get that thing patented. Borrow the money. Do whatever you, whatever you can, but get it patented. It really can help you greatly if you're willing to defend it. If you've got some big players in the marketplace that, um, that can come down on you hard, be very careful. I do. I think it's a great idea. Now it depends on your product. For example, crowdsourcing usually is where you're making a widget and you're pre-selling that widget at a deep discount. So they give you the money up front, you take that money and make it, and then send them the widget. And that's a way of getting capital to make your, get your inventory going. But I think crowdsourcing is a, is a great idea, and there's a lot of good ones out there. We usually, uh, good question, by the way. We usually send people to the SBDC here. Thank you. <laughs> I represent the Small Business Development Center. Well, I said that earlier, but you were gone, too, so. <laughs> Uh, because they really know what they're doing to get you, to get you uh, we don't do that kind of stuff, but we send you to the SBDC to do it. I've sent three people there, Gretchen, in the last two weeks. I don't know whether they've called yet, but I have, so. Anybody else? Yes, sir. <laughs> no, what I mean by that is, Entrepreneurship is great, and it, and it builds value for your employees, 
and for your family. Um, but there is a sacrifice that you make. I mean, you, you, you're going to think about it. You're going to think about your business at 3 o'clock in the morning while you're sleeping. You're going to, you know, you're, it's going to constantly be on your mind. And after a while, that kind of drains your emotional energy. And there are many times when I'm sitting in my office at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in my other life, and I'm, hol I'm, I'm holding on to the desk saying, it's been a great day. What's going to happen this afternoon? Um, so you never know what Scud missile is going to come in. For example, and I'll make a quick example of this. Uh, one day was that great day, and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I got a fax from France. One of our scissors was blamed for killing a patient in Paris. Now, that has never happened. Um, it ended up not to be the case. But for several weeks, I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And though that's the emotional drain that you have when you start a business. You're going to have issues flooding you at all times. You're going to have things happen that will come right out of the blue. In fact, most of the things that happen do come right out of the blue that aren't anticipated. But you just have to have the personality and the style to roll with it and not let it get you down. And that's where an advisory group or your employee group really comes in handy. Because you sit down and talk to them and you say, am I crazy? And sometimes they say, yeah, you are. That's true. But that's what it's all about. That's why I call myself and they call themselves recovering entrepreneurs. Uh, actually, not at the center. We're strictly a mentoring group, but I'm glad you brought that up because every second Tuesday of the month from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Willoughby Brewing Company, we have a what we call a STS meeting. I won't tell you what STS means. Actually, I will. It, says, it means shoot the shit. That's what it means. <laughs> now, we also call it a shark tank. Because there are people in there that have funded other companies within it. But what we do is we have a speaker that's on for 20 minutes in the beginning. And then people like you guys come up and say, hey, I've got this product idea. I can't tell you everything about it. But what do you guys think? And it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. It's been going on. It was Dr. Krolovic, Ray Krolovic's idea, not mine. But we put it on. We schedule it. We send out the, the uh, uh, announcements for it. Uh, the only thing, it doesn't cost you any money unless you want to buy a beer for yourself or for me, whatever you want to do. So um, um, maybe put that on the schedule. And if you have your, your contact information and want to be it, get the announcements for each meeting with the new speaker and so on, just let me know before we end, OK, before you leave. STS, Shark Tank, shoot the shit. That was Ray's idea. We have several people from Cuyahoga County. Um, believe it or not, I, I spoke at the Willoughby South Entrepreneurship Center um, several months ago. And this, the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs students are, are actually, they just can't sign up for the course. They have to be interviewed. You know, how serious are you about this? And we got a lot of, we had one student from South. That was it. We had a couple students from Mentor. The rest of them were for Brush High School. And I thought, this is fantastic. So I gave the, I gave the speech, and I got three of those people from Brush submitted applications. They have good ideas. So you just never know. So in our entrepreneurship center, the youngest age is 17. The oldest is 74. So we run the gamut. And by the way, for all of the ladies in the room, 48% of the people who have signed up with us are women, which is close to the 51 or 50% we need. Anybody else?
I, um, I would recommend that you really try to get over the fear. Um, there, are, there are certain, uh, you know, you could fail. But, you know, I always say failure is good because you learn something from it. You know, I don't know. I, I risked a lot because I had a wife and two kids at the time uh, and a house and a car and all that kind of stuff. And so I, and I borrowed money to start the company. Uh, actually, I refinanced my house to start the company. Uh, but they, you know, their names were on it. So if I failed, they'd have everything, which is usually the case with, with banks. Uh, but you know, that's with their job. So I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't uh, cast aspersions on them and all. That's just the way they have to be. And for today's federal regulations, they have no choice. So, um, but I would, I would go for it. I really would. I, you know, and. And if you, if you really question it, give us a call. Go to the website and just submit, and we can talk about it. If you got some ideas, we can talk about it. And it's really easy to start a company today. I mean, go to the SBDC, you got your name, you got your LLC, you, got your, your, you can get a trademark done, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, and then, and then the, the hard part is getting revenues. You know, that's the hard part. The three things entrepreneurs need is talent, resources, and revenues. And revenues are sometimes the hardest thing to get. So you gotta really know your market. You gotta have a good plan for who you're marketing to. Watch your pricing, stuff like that. Anybody else? Oh boy, I'd have found a way. I might have not have gotten 100K, but I found a way. I'd have gone to the employees and say, hey, this is the situation. And they were always pretty good about it. Uh, maybe postponed salaries or something like that for a while. Um, I think one thing I did do is when I got in trouble like that, I didn't take a salary. I didn't take anything out of the company. And, and you're, you know, every, almost every entrepreneur goes through that. And you, right. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. I think alcohol really helps a lot. <laughs> good California Chardonnay helps a lot. Um, you just have to be around good people. That's your strength. With me, I'm, I'm in my element. I'm around great people. I love doing this. I don't know if you can tell. I love doing this. I love to, to talk about stories about entrepreneurship. I love this is, I don't know if I'm teaching it, but at least you understand where a lot of these people come from. But be around good people and they, they'll build you up. Make sense? Okay. Anybody else? Thank you so much for listening to me. Appreciate it very much. Hope the food was good. To you.